Okay, then uh, online. I don't want to repeat the online. Then let me give a very brief introduction of Taiwan's democratic voting process because I think the so-called party politics must happen in a democratic or democratic environment. If not a democratic society, we don't expect there's a kind of party competition. So there's a, a very uh, a brief introduction. Uh, Taiwan kind of the democratization process, I think uh, beginning in 1950, uh, the year KMT, the previous ruling party moved from mainland to Taiwan, defeated by Communist Party. Okay, uh, from the 1950, uh, these two set kind of a historical period I would combine uh, called the kind of authoritarian period ruling by KMT, the so-called KMT Chinese Nationalist Party in Chinese means Guomindang. Then from there's an article called uh, these two periods from hard authoritarianism to soft authoritarianism. Then KMT is dominant. The major feature for these two periods was the martial law was in effect. And this martial law announced by KMT in 1950. That's a uh, background. It, because uh, the martial law in effect, so you can think of it, many political activity uh, were banned during that period. Then the uh, for the second period, different is still also turning the KMT dominant. The DPP, so called the Democratic Progressive Party, formed in 1986. That's really a uh, meaningful uh, milestone. I remember when that time, 1984. I was studying in the U.S. in, a, in my university, Mich University of Michigan. My professor so happily asked me to come to his office and show me that she eventually your country got the opposition party. That's the year 1986. Then 1987, the, uh, uh, I call the rapidly democratizing period. Not only many scholars, because martial law lifted in, in the year 1987. Then DPP newly organized a year before the late martial law you keep that in your mind set agenda for reforms then the KMT leader or and also president at that time Li Denghui that's his picture launched the constitutional reform actually echo back to uh, DPP's requirement to work together to a certain extent that's uh, uh, for the first three then the move to 1996, we got, Lee was elected that year, but during this period, 2008, we got two times party rotation. One, 2000, is Chen Zhe-bian, President Chen zhe he's from DPP. Then 2008, is Ma ying -jou. Then we, we come back to KMT, uh, according to the uh, Professor Huntington from US, he said, uh, call it a uh, 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 turnover test. If you got two times turnover, party turnover means more peaceful, more consolidated. That's what he said before. Then uh, 2009 to 16, I call the democratic dividend period, the two party competition and third time party rotation. That's 2016. Two after 2016, until now, I will say, and also uh, back to our kind of topic today, newly emerging authoritarianism. Uh, right now, ruled, ruled by DPP uh, is relatively dominant. The current president and DPP chairperson is uh, Tsai Ing-wen here, okay? Then the theoretical concept, I would like to give a brief concept regarding why, what I call the authoritarianism. Uh, I use the Lin's kind of idea, there's uh, several articles he published. First is mentality building for authoritarianism when Linz tried to set up the distinction between authoritarianism and totalitarianism, he said totalitarianism, like the kind of net, like the Mao Zedong's China during Mao Zedong's Cultural Revolution, usually will using some very uh, logically uh, closely connected ideology. They call he called it ideology because the kind of concept. Uh, Link to each other very logically and very tightly. But on the other hand, for authoritarian regime, usually have some mentality, it's not so strong. The idea linkage is not so logical, but build up certain mentality, try to convince people, follow this mentality. But usually, this mentality will emphasize a certain crisis, a certain enemy, then legitimize concentration of power in the hands of a ruling party. 
that's a kind of first criterion for authoritarianism. Secondly, it is authoritarian certainly is not so pluralistic. Limited pluralism discriminates certain groups. They are believed to link with the crisis emphasized because you will say uh, uh, emphasize either inside or outside the enemy. So you will say this group is dangerous, whatever. Then the third criterion is shrunk the freedom of speech. Uh, second constraint, certain speech that are considered to deliver messages, further enhancing the sad crisis altogether. You also turn the regime usually need to set up an enemy crisis, then, then concentrate power in the ruler's hand. Then we'll do these things uh, like limited, probably the shrunk freedom of speech. The party politics, uh, my sense of, of party politics involving three dimensions. First is party system. Uh, certainly in democracy, when you decide a party system, usually decide by the seat in parliament in Taiwan's legislature. The picture show the legislature, uh, Taiwan's legislature, we call the legislative yuan. Then ideological division, we decide by party platform, a party manifesto. If you are kind of a former party, you attend a party uh, election competition, you certainly need to have party platform or manifesto. Party competitiveness, I uh, estimated by the chance of having party rotation. Yeah, the regular routine for a kind of healthy democracy, we expect to have party rotation regularly. It's a theoretical concept. Then we start with the uh, KMT authoritarian rule from 1950 to 1986. Uh, There's a Chinese character called Xie Yan martial law, where martial law in effect. Then by the authoritarian characteristic, uh, I listed the three criteria. During this period, the KMT rule, mentality building, the KMT always said the threat of Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, is what was horrible, dangerous enemy should be totally destroyed. And clan, so-called ROC, the formal title for Taiwan's national name is Republic of China, Free China call ourselves China, Taiwan, Free China versus evil CCP. Even at that time during the KMT authoritarian rule, he did the, the KMT or the Jiang Kai-shek at that time, didn't want to speak out that there's a country called PRC. It's, it's a rebellious group, only CCP Communist Party. There's no such thing called the PRC during that period. That's a, I mean, that's a totally rebellious group. That's a mentality building. The limited pluralism, for KMT uh, martial law, banning on organizing any new political party yeah, during that period. So there's no new party emerged uh, during this period. Uh, but there are there were two minor parties also follow KMT, migrate from mainland to Taiwan in the year 1949. These two parties uh, was joked by other people say that's two races in grassroots, no use, no function. That's a uh, uh, at, during this period, then shrink, shrunk freedom of speech uh, can be also banning on establishing new places under martial law. No new places, only the previous three major uh, places during that period. Okay, that's a uh, first KMT's uh, also term rule. Then the party parties, the party system, for sure, can be absolutely dominated in uh, legislative year, so called parliament or legislature. You can see the seats. Total seats, the number from uh, 1950 to 1983, but number var varies four to a blah blah blah, then to 366. Uh, because the KMT claimed the kind of legislature elected in 1948 when KMT still owned the mainland and the legislature were elected from the, all the men and every, uh, every province. So can be claimed this legislature elected in 1948, still legally represent the entire China, claim the legitimacy, won't let them uh, retire. So they stay in this legislature's job for many years, but they will they will die, pass away. So the number of virus, KMT also notice a problem so they start, the KMT start to recruit so-called supplementary member from Taiwan in the year 1969, start very minimal number increasing gradually a lot, but the pass away number also 
the previous senior legislator also passed away a lot. So the number varies. See, you can see from the total end, so different from uh, each term to the other uh, term. A KMT, certainly you can see majority, more than 90%. DPP, actually during this period, there was no party named DPP, but there's a kind of group called outside the party, outside the KMT. They organize, they mobilize, vote together, they make the kind of a, uh, a democratic plan, and they ask the KMT reform, etc. So they occupy a few seats, start from, all come from, come from the supplementary election, they call it supplementary legislature. The kind of the number are very, very uh, small. Okay, that's a, a party system. Ideological division in this period, KMT always plan Chinese nationalism because KMT still consider itself represent entire China, so called. So the national title also Republic of China. Then KMT certain anti CCP. Then Dang Wai outside KMT, like I mentioned before. Convert to DPP after 1986, established DPP established in the year 1986. What they call it, if you notice, year before martial law, there's a story there. Uh, the DPP anti KMT authoritarian rule for sure. And also, they claim Taiwan independence as a hidden. Then they, they cannot claim, but they did something, they internal kind of. A, then they talking about anything they like to promote Taiwan independence, but not allowed everywhere, uh, especially in under martial law. So they treat as a hidden agenda. I believe you know the meaning of hidden agenda. The so called party competition during this period is one to zero because no chance for uh, opposition party, DPP or Dang Wai, have chance to have party rotation. Then the DPP competition, that's 1987 to 1995. This is a rapid democratization period, if you remember. Even formed in 1986, they, they consider their, their self was very dangerous because national law still effect uh, in the year before 1987. So they, uh, they consider that time the president may send them to the prison, but Jiang Jingguo didn't do anything. Certainly a lot of story behind it. No time to talk about that, maybe later. Then martial law lifted that. Jiang Jingguo passed away in 1988. There's a picture show that a lot of people still very, very sad in that period. Then his uh, uh, vice president, Jiang Jingguo's vice president, Li Denghui, succeeded as the first so-called Taiwanese president. I don't know how many of you know about kind of Taiwan politics, so-called Taiwanese or Bananjo. That's a kind of a very important distinction for a uh, political kind of a camp, but later, no time to talk about, into the details. And also, Li Zhengfei launched the constitution reform, changed the KMT's uh, uh, kind of a uh, constitution regime, and make the, the senior legislator I mentioned before, retire, totally retire, and also put the kind of direct election of Taiwan president, the current president, into the constitution. Otherwise, in the past, the constitution only uh, set up a kind of indirect uh, election of the president, the president elected by so-called national assembly person in the past. But uh, in the 1994, changed to the current one, direct election by Taiwanese people. That's, this is Jie Ye, that's the Denghui first elected as the president. Then the DPP competition, the party system from 1987 to 1995, you see the party system moving toward the two party system. You see the picture. Then you see the seed percentage in legislative year. The 1987 three to, to three, uh, KMT at that time still 90%, but DPP was a minor party. I remember only certain something. Then the move to 1990, uh, the come up the, all together. The previous or the senior legislature pass away a lot, so the total is become two hundred something. Can they still 84 percent? But DPP nearly ten. Nineteen ninety three, why DPP increased uh, uh, dramatically thirty two percent? Can they roughly uh, fifty nine? That's uh, after constitutional reform in the uh, legislature previous elected legislature. 
entirely retired in the year 1992. So 1993 is a new beginning. All the 161 uh, legislators elected directly from Taiwan. That's a very important milestone. That's, that's why TMT dropped to 60% from EPP 32. Okay. Then the uh, party party ideological division during this period, TMT still plan unification with mainland China in the future. Taiwanization as a hidden agenda. Actually, from Li Denghui as a president, he had to push the so called reform of the uh, textbook. And also, but he still uh, promulgated the so called uh, outline for uh, unification with Myanmar uh, during the Li Denghui era. But he is the first person, did not, Li Denghui did not accept the so called 92 consensus. Uh, by the way, I mentioned it because many people of you may know about 92 consensus between Myanmar and Taiwan. DPP uh, claimed Taiwanese nationalism. Uh, Taiwanese nationalism is certainly different from Chinese nationalism. Taiwan is in the everything. I don't, I don't have time to go through the detail. But Taiwan independence is still a hidden agenda. Not formally say that, but quietly did that. That's uh, during this period, party party. Then the kind of a party competitiveness, a competitiveness, you can see DPP very, very powerful. It's a very strong opposition party, so growing very fast. You see the number already. Then how can they achieve their influence or kind of a become so powerful? Because they launch kind of fighting in the legislature. Yeah, I don't know how many of you pay attention to the international mass media. Actual media report Taiwan's party, especially legislative activity. The number one, the first one, is uh, fighting in the legislature. Yeah. The DPP newly elected member in 1987, they launched this kind of fighting. They fight against the KMT senior uh, uh, legislator and they tell us, tell, uh, directly call them, you guys are OC. You should stay home. How come you still stay? In legislative even for so many years. That's it. certainly I'm saying in a very polite way. They use some other very, uh, very harsh words. Then DPP successfully pushed senior legislator elected from the mainland entirely retired. Then uh, even Chen Shui-bian initiated this kind of bill, certainly supported by not only KMT, also KMT chair. That's a different way. So it got a kind of a, uh, a grand justice proof that. Okay, that's a history, part of the history. Okay, multi-party for this period, I call the multi-party, but actually two can compete, 1996 to 2008, the year. The first direct election of president in 1996, a background that Li elected. President Li uh, elected as the first Taiwanese president, launched three, another three constituent reform, 1997, very important one, 1989, 2000, he totally abandoned the so-called the national assembly. Uh, the organization used to elect it, elect the president. A very important one, but totally abandoned. That's a reason why President Chen elected in two thousand. He launched the seventh constitutional reform, also very important, very influential, because he uh, Chen Shui-bian's constitutional reform changed the electoral rule in two thousand five, and the two thousand eight was the first time to follow this new rule. The previous electoral rule called the multi-member district and the single non-transferable vote, what we call SNTD. I don't know how many of you are familiar with the kind of compared parties. We uh, compared parties, uh, political scientists like to do, do electoral rule and the, the rule institutional influence upon the party system. That's a very important, famous one, SNTD, but you don't need to know the detail. To the single member district, only elect one data leader in each district. For this kind of a, a, a system, only elect, uh, elect 70%, it's a lot. And proportional representative, we call a PR, 30%. For party vote, this is a party, you vote for party, and party see how many votes they share, then got the seat share, but only 30%. This kind of system, especially single member district called SMD, occupies 70% of the total seat, means easy to make two party com compete. A uh, small party only can make use of partner share a little bit seat in legislative UN. 
but not so easy to become a, a mainstream part. That's a kind of a, a institutional rule. Uh, we will see the detail. Then party system, multiple, but actually only two camps. We call it blue and green. That's blue, that's a mind job, that's tiny one, and the green. Okay, you see the picture. Then the seats, the seat percentage. 1996, Li Denghui was the president. Total number increasing a lot, a little bit from uh, 161164. Kim T only margin, we need a margin, uh, my, even though still majority, but only 52%. DPP already 33 something. There's a new party. I don't know whether you hear this or not. New party called New Party. Uh, affiliated with Kim T actually at that time uh, under the SMTV. There's a people, first party at that time, no such party. Then you see there's a empty here means no party has not existed yet. Then the KMT to 1999, uh, the still 50 something. TPP dropped a little bit. But 2002, KMT become the second largest party. The largest party is DPP. Chen Chui was in power. He was the president in 2000. And why can he become in, immediately become such a <laughs> medium sized uh, party? Because people first party organized in the year 2000. If you, you know Taiwan uh, political history a little bit, uh, there's a, a provincial governor called Song Chu Yu, Jimmy Song, run for the president in 2000, separately from KMT. He was a KMT member. Then, because the split between KMT and uh, uh, Song Chu Yu, so uh, Chen Jiebie won the presidency. Uh, Song Chui then after the election organized People First Party and then occupied certain seats for some year until 2008, become the single member district, KMT dominant, uh, People First Party shrinking. Uh, then the TSU also organized after Li Zhenghui stepped down 2000. Uh, many people say that Li Zhenghui actually is a godfather of the T Taiwan Solidarity Union. The Taiwan Solidarity Union, you see the, the, the color is green, so affiliated with DPP and new party and people first party usually associated with KMT called a pan blue uh, uh, group. There's a pan green group. That's a, uh, you can see the distribution. Uh, in this period, only this two, two period, KMT wasn't very dominant. DPP was a majority party in the uh, legislative year. Kim T, after a while, Kim T come back uh, as, as my angel was president, then got more seats. But usually, you can see the competition between the two camps. The ideological di division during this period, blue camp, pro China, uh, more identified than as both Chinese and Taiwanese. There's a kind of a, we call the national identity issue. Green camp, then pro independence, identify themselves as Taiwanese only. I should go a little bit quickly. Then this kind of survey show you the kind of changing identity called national identity. There's a Taiwanese a green line. In the very beginning, until 1994, 97, the blue line was a Chinese only, a little bit higher the green. See, but but so called the both identify them uh then as both Taiwanese Chinese quite high in the beginning. But in recent years, you see the drop, even the both Chinese become not even three percent. But Taiwanese majority is uh, more than 60%. You see the trend, the kind of the change in Taiwan political landscape. Okay, the identity distinction. Then DPP also turn rule start 2017. Uh, uh, There's a uh, Taiwan won the presidency the first time 2016. A party system, I talk about party system first because of the Taiwan rule is a judgment. Later I'll show you. Party system, DPP relatively dominant. We still see the kind of percentage of latent uh, ATVM. Let's see, 113 after uh, electoral reform, 113, 113 start from 2008. The DPP in 2006 got the first got the majority of legislature. They really happy. And then 2020, they still the majority. Uh, and also very safe majority. It's mar that margin. They, they are okay. They can push anything. Uh, uh, any bill they want, they want to have. Can be a little bit increased, but still become minor. Others, um, small parties like New Power Party emerged in 2016. Then the seat 
percentage always low because they only can share the PR uh, proportion, the 30%. TPP, Taiwan People Party, only emerged in 2019. Got a uh, pretty good seat only from the PR tier. Yeah, but, uh, if you know about Taiwan Party, this Taiwan People Party, the leader is the Taiwan mayor, uh, a Taipei mayor, Taiwan, Taipei city mayor called Cohen Zhe, Professor Ge, yeah, Ke, was the doctor. Uh, he is also very popular to a certain extent. That's a, a Cohen Zhe's party. Then People First Party, the Jimmy Song's party, actually in 2020 totally disappeared. They cannot get any seats through the PR tier. Then there's a Taiwan State Building Party. Obviously, and this uh, very silently claim Taiwan should be independent, build it, uh, 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 its own state, so-called Taiwan State Building Party, got a seat, only one seat in late state year. This Taiwan State Building Party actually closely uh, associated with DPP. DPP as a ruling party cannot say something very extremely or claim independence directly. There's a lot of constraint. But Taiwan State Building, since uh, this party has no chance to rule uh, the foreseeable future, they can say whatever they want to say. Yeah. Okay, that's that. The DPP also can rule. The party parties, ideology division. That's the Ivoldra I established, so called VAA. I don't think we have time to go through detail. I don't. I know in your country, Sweden, you also have this kind of mechanism that as political party build in their policy stance uh, in accordance with uh, a question or whatever, then put uh, uh, on the website uh, after uh, analysis, we see the party position. Uh, we do the same thing. Then we uh, put the uh, put this kind of a policy, the party's policy stance on website. Welcome voters to fill in the same questionnaire, we will do the kind of a uh, match, a vote match with which party uh, a kind of a, a voter close with. This is uh, what I did 2016, 2020, twice. You just see the kind of, a, this are uh, two dimension, the uh, horizontal dimension, X3, is uh, traditional right and the left. Uh, right, left is right, is, right is right, left is left. And the vertical one is so-called unification with mainland China, but we don't use that term. Proactive interaction with mainland cultures interaction uh, with uh, China or it's pro uh, China, anti-China, like this kind of vertical line. Can this here more brightest, more proactive interaction with China? Certain people know that. Uh, people first party. It's around here, that's more left, a little bit left. Actually, we can see all the central ground. DPP fill in the questionnaire we sent to, to DPP. They fill in, but the Taiwan was a chair at that time, and she knows she will she would win in 2016. So she is allowed to be published. So we just show you kind of because this kind of a this risk. The, any voter, if you fill in, you can get it signed. There's a small uh, person with a uh, with a, uh, kind of speaker. So DP roughly here is understandable because he's a, a ruling party. He the party party stands won't won't be too extreme. Stand in the middle, in, either in the kind of vertical line, so called uh, independence and uh, unification, uh, close to independence certainly. But not so go extreme. But the left and right is a little bit uh, leftist. But other small parties like New Power Party, they are leftist and the pro independence very clearly. That's it. The similar picture also appeared in the 2020, just show you the ideological distinction. But in Taiwan, the dominant ideological difference is still along this vertical line, so called pro China or anti China, this word vertical. The left is right is that people just say something, please, but uh, to the majority or the kind of ruling party, only two ruling parties, uh, KMT or DPP, they were all very capitalist oriented. There's a lot of studies there. That's a questionnaire we used, we don't need to go to the detail. If you like to see it, you can uh, read later. Then party party competitiveness for this period, I, why we say also Terry, then you will understand later. Community lose certain degree of competitiveness because, as I mentioned, 
PPP already got a majority seat in the uh, legislature in L1. So they immediately passed a law called Act, a uh, uh, governing the handling of their gotten property by political parties and their affiliated organization. It's a long name, very awkward. But the target is KMP, uh, because they claim KMP got a lot of illegal property. So they banned the property, the forfeited the property uh, of uh, KMP. So, so KMP just lose resources a lot, quite a lot, uh, actually tremendous. <laughs> then the pro-China policy stands as KMP's traditional uh, party uh, platform, currently do not cope with the mainstream of public opinion in Taiwan. You can see the mainstream. Uh, we have no time to go through detail, but you see the two mainstream. The first, the blue one, is per permanent maintained data core indeb indefinitely. This one quite high, gradually. Then the kind of independence as soon as possible, the green one, you see, also increased a lot recently. Altogether, uh, already more than 50%. Yeah, 50%. So called uh, unification, that's a red line here, only. 1%, that's a unification as soon as possible. And for the kind of darker uh, uh, red line here, it's so called the uh, maintain state quo move toward unification, only 6, 7%, altogether 7% for kind of pro unification. So if you can claim to uh, pro China kind of a price statement, does it do not appeal to? Taiwanese people at the moment. There's certainly that's a main his data course. See what will happen in the future, still a little bit of majority. That's for your reference only. Then the people impression of a many China government recent years, especially after 2017, KMT, uh, DPP uh, come back to rule that increased a lot unfavorable. But people, people still feel okay. So also show you kind of current. Then I will tell you why I call this period also a term rule. DPT. The three still the three dimensions, three criteria. Mentality building strongly anti-China, no doubt about the current government's the main main thing, main kind of a slogan. Not only TRC but also RC Republic China. The previous the currently still the legal constitutional name for Taiwan called Republic of China. Textbook revised decentralization. There's a lot of details. No time to go through. Here, just two cartoons show the current. You don't know the Chinese character. I'm sorry, but Professor Lo Dobi may know that. I'm afraid of uh, China, these two characters, Zhongguo. So cross it over, cross it out. And all kind of uh, uh, company cooperation with China with, uh, as a title. Sorry, just change it into Taiwan. And passport uh, also changed the uh, kind of cover. In the past, the 2008, the passport, you see the difference. Republic of China was very big in the uh, 2008 version, but right now, no ROC. Taiwan, bigger. Certainly, Chinese character, Zhonghua Mingo, still there. ROC, where is ROC? ROC is inside here. It's very small, difficult to see. Okay. Then the kind of a COVID 19, you, you all know the vaccine. I don't know how much you read about the news report. China over always rejected. Certainly, a lot of conspiracy say uh, crisis. I mean, uh, the China they never be trust. Blah blah blah. There's a lot of report here because currently we are really in a very bad situation for the sort of a COVID nineteen problem. We are still we are almost uh, uh, locked down everywhere. I can only stay in my office and also launch the uh, our classes always online until the end of uh, June. Uh, Right now, still not very good, but we don't have enough vaccine. The reject from China. Everything try to say China is bad. Yes, the current mentality building. And limited pluralism. Uh, the uh, Thai government passed the so called anti permeation law in December. Uh, discriminate group of people, subtly, who work, study in, uh, in or has some connection with PRC. If some you have a friend there, you work there, you study there, and this law just say something very ambiguous. Say if you receive resources from the kind of a uh, PRC, then you may uh, commit certain crime, whatever. That's really uh, very horrible. Very simple. Only tell uh, 
uh, items, but when people feel very uncertain about what kind of condition will be uh, commit a crime, then strong freedom of speech. Uh, uh, Simon Gunn, the closure on China friendly news channel called uh, Zhongtian TV or CTI News. BBC uh, reported, but not in English. Sorry, I cannot give you the English uh, reference. Close it. And also, right now, close watching them opinion in social media under the name of so called anti cognitive warfare launched by the uh, PRC. The uh, PRC launched a lot of warfare, so we better uh, also anti then examine many things in social media. Uh, okay, come to the conclusion. Actually, I would like to pose a question, ask myself and also ask the audience, why DPP as a crucial fighter for Taiwan's democratization, but also turn itself into an authoritarian ruler, similar to its fall at KMT. I have certain explanation, cultural uh, ecological environment, whatever, and also like in the beginning, uh, Larissa mentioned about uh, hegemonic power struggle, you know, internationally, uh, came to, uh, uh, China competed uh, against with US or US struggle between China or oh, geopolitical location influence Taiwan certain is made these kind of factors, immediate factors or the kind of cultural uh, deep ecological environment influence that kind of current situation. But I will also say is Taiwan's case unique? Then I show you also terrorism in America. Also terrorism. I agree with these two authors comments but i have different explanation it's not a momentary minus uh, but an eternal dynamic within a liberal democracy they explain this phenomenon especially uh, president trump's phenomenon as also turning them from the perspective of social psychology because people the culture the kind of psychological root for human nature is in terms of difference for everyone, for most democratic people, they are intolerant of authoritarian personality oriented people. Yeah, make it simple because I don't have enough time to say too much. Okay, that's my kind of presentation. I already try my best to make it very short, but still very long. Thank you. Wait for Q and A. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yeah, very clear. Okay, well, perfect. Uh, thank you very much for this very interesting presentation. Uh, with a lot of information, a lot to take in. It's uh, quite. Also, uh, I reference after. <laughs> uh, over a lot of reference. Yeah, right. Can read okay, I would like to remind the audience that you can post your questions in the Q and A function below, and I would like to jump right in. We have a question from Julian Tucker who says, uh, you touched a bit, uh, and thank you very much for a very interesting and thought-provoking lecture. You touched a bit on third parties and the creation of new political movements. For the foreseeable future, the KMT and the DPP share an interest in reinforcing a two-party system. Could you go into more detail about efforts to promote a multi-party system? Well, multi-party uh, system, okay. Uh, the so from the society side, like scholar like me, I like to push forward a multi-party system, but it's difficult. Uh, I can tell you immediately because uh, right now the two party, uh, especially the ruling party DPP, push forward another constitutional reform. Set up the, the agenda maybe next year for uh, having another constitutional reform, but. Even though uh, kind of a small party like uh, people uh, like uh, Taiwan People Party and like Scholar promote a multi-party system, you know you, we have to design the kind of more proportional representative seats for small parties, right? Enlarge the seat. Right now, only thirty percent of the PR seats. We like to have a half of the legislative seat for PR and uh, uh, lower the threshold. Right now, we have a five percent for small parties to share the pie. But we like to have a, a lower, like 3.5% uh, of the party vote to ensure the seat. But the problem is we have very high kind of a uh, constitutional re amendment uh, threshold. Very, very difficult to push forward or totally uh, 
renew our constitution. The, the constitution amendment threshold right now in Taiwan is first, three fourths of the legislature support a constitution reform proposal. Three fourths legislature. By certainly, uh, uh, they appear uh, in the legislature, not everyone, not by the total, three fourths, the first. Then, if this constitution draft passed by the legislature uh, by a three fourths, then we have to send to for the referendum for the general vote, people support. The threshold for people support this constitutional amendment proposal proposed by the legislature is one half of the total elite, uh, 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 electorate. Like we have 19 million, then we need to have 5 million, 50, uh, 85 million. Do you understand what I'm talking about number? So it's difficult to have a real benefit multi-party systems continue reform right now. And so far, what I know about the kind of a possibility to, to have a constitutional reform item is lower the voting age from 20 to 80. 20 to 80. Right now, our legitimate voting age is 20. Then the kind of a, uh, the proposal is a law to 18. Right now, it's only possible that the consensus from every political party, this kind of change can be passed. So it's difficult right now, but I never is true the kind of all kind of effort in the future. Yeah, maybe we need a lot of a lot of kind of a outside force to influence the kind of a, the two major parties mentality. The two major parties like to to hold on the current system because they too benefit from the current system. Do you follow Hi. what I said? Okay, okay, thank you so much for elaborating. Um, what you just said before I jump to the next question about uh, having an outside force, what, what do you refer to that? <laughs> outside force, like the international kind of political or uh, international academic community support that or the kind of uh, uh, the current uh, or the international uh, partnership from the, like we have the mass uh, mobilization we have a social movement back to 2014. Then internationally uh, notice the young people ask for kind of new party agenda. At that time, TMT president, that's my job, put forward a kind of service trip, uh, service pact, cross, cross street service pact agreement. Then the young generation just oppose that. Then got international support, say, okay, may, you may stop that, even though it's domestic events. Like the two major parties, without the international help, I think that only come from the domestic force, difficult. So we need to have social movement. The social movement need to have a kind of a very good reason to support, to open up more democratic society, more democracy should be, uh, uh, to, to be uh, taken to Taiwan society. That's a kind of a future work. This is only my imagination. If you ask me at the current phenomenon, I tell you the kind of a threshold is too difficult. You need to help, to be helped by many different kinds of sources. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's jump to the next question by Hal for Eifring. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong. Um, he says, uh, some of the examples of authorita authoritarian tendencies relate to the threat from the PRC in media, in economy, etc. Do you see some, of, some such policies as beneficial for Taiwan, or are they all destructive? You mean the men in China? Yes, I think that's what he's referring to. Yeah. Uh, actually, I should tell you, uh, or the, you, may, you may already notice. Maybe we export to mainland China each year, our export total, roughly 50% our export depend upon mainland China's market. So they are still this kind of a relationship. Certainly, mainland China also benefit from Taiwan's exploration, especially like the chips, you know, semiconductor chips. They also need our product. But on the other hand, we also need a lot of things from like the, their market, 
a certain uh, Brahma art. I see techniques we are too advanced, a lot of it advanced and then to a certain extent. But whether their policy benefit us, internationally speaking, no. They, their international policy just try to stop Taiwan to appear in any important international occasion like WHO. But on the other hand, domestically, they try to something, but subject to interpretation. Some people say they are good, but some people say they are evil. They definitely try to gain something from you, not only give you some negative vaccine, like vaccine. Always in Taiwan, what China, what whatever China doing in Taiwan always divide into two different opinions. Good and bad. No, no one single certain we can say we cannot talk about Chinese intention. Just difficult to prove the intention. But in Taiwan, people will say Chinese intention never be good to Taiwan. But his kind of purpose is clear. Try to get Taiwan back. His purpose is always speak very clearly and outspoken. Never, yeah, never try to hide that kind of purpose. All right. Um, All right. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so we have another question from Bo yeah. uh, Lin, who says, oh. "Thank you." Uh, pressure from the mainland is bound to increase uh, and deepening tensions. Uh, do you then expect the DPP to consolidate its authoritarian tendencies? And what's your projection? You said uh, DPP will continue to consolidate its uh, kind of authoritarian control. So the, the question is, uh, do you yeah. expect the DPP to consolidate its authoritarian tendencies and okay. what your projection is? Okay, yeah, the, right now, you know, the, at this moment, because of, of the COVID-19, the kind of out of control, so DPP even more tightly control this uh, kind of term tendency. They said because of this new crisis, so-called COVID-19. For this moment, I think the, the DPP will keep on this tightly control, also sorry, consolidate further. Uh, but next year will be an election year for the local election. Every local election, when election is there, you know, political party will do something to please the voters. So it's not so firmly a uh, straight line, but fluctuate with the situation. If DPP didn't win a lot of local seats in terms of our county, city, city mayor, county magistrate, they will relax a little bit, I believe, because the kind of winning, uh, the, the, the kind of a, uh, election outcome always influences the way of doing things. But the Taiwan problem is, can DPP or either can DPP or can be never decide on their own. There's some other outside forces like US, mainly maybe minor, but actually it's a counter force. And, Men that act this way, the political party will act the other way, like DPP. So the kind of election fluctuation will influence the kind of a DPP's authoritarian rule, but not totally removed. Why? Because what he did right now, the DPP did, like the uh, uh, pre uh, anti permeation law, is here. Anti permeation law is law, then if the party use it, can do a lot of things. So it's not in your turn, consoli or not, but in set up this law constraint, it's then the internal dynamic or fluctuation depend upon the situation. The law of the year, the authoritarian rule will not come from the, if no rule, no law, come on, just every political system will do something authoritarian. But if become a law, then depend upon immediate situation. That's what that I answer. And the election will influence us something, but the law is still there. All right, thank you so much for elaborating. Um, we have another question by uh, Rasmus Björklund, who says, oh. Rasmus Björklund, 
So he says, most liberal democracies are facing problems with authoritarian regimes spreading disinformation in traditional and social media. When you mentioned censorship in Taiwan, I didn't really understand how far the national scope went. Would you say Taiwan society sees a crackdown on the political opposition's local media outlets, or is it just an attempt for Taiwan to hinder foreign disinformation campaigns? Oh, I think uh, it's really uh, interesting. Good question. Uh, government always say whatever. I think government, government anywhere, especially under the kind of the new technical environment and the social media uh, prevalent everywhere. This information is everywhere. Yeah. The government said, okay, whatever he, uh, the government is doing is anti disinformation. But, you know, the power is never be balanced between government and the society. So, if government wants to do the job of some anti disinformation, government will become a kind of a source of uh, disinformation uh, distribution. That's what I see and I believe. Yeah, it's everywhere, not only my government. The government cannot touch this part. No constraint on kind of a uh, freedom of speech. Only come from society. No government. If government intervene, they will immediately become our social media. That's my belief. All right. Society to do this. Society force. No executive power. No executive power should do this. Okay. Spread on social media information. Yeah. From private sector, from social organization, from NGO. Yeah. You you can do this, but no government. Government own too much power. Imbalanced. Never, never be balanced between government and ordinary people or society. All right. Thank you. Thank you so much for your take on this one. Um before before we come to the end, I would like to ask about um, the Green Party that that featured in, in the 2020 yeah. election. Yeah. Would you mind elaborating a bit on, on their uh, impact? Green Party. Yeah. Actually, the uh, Green Party was kind of a, uh, a little bit powerful in the pe previous election. Got 2% of the vote, the party vote, two hours, almost three. Yeah, according to my memory. But in 2020, Green Party merged with the so called uh, uh, Social Democrats. Social Democrats. They merged together, and their leader right now called Fan Yun. The two parties merged, two parties. Their leader become the uh, nominated by DPP as the PR legislature. Now she is in the legislature. Yeah. So she work with the government but the green party merged with the social democrats party uh, uh well, but right now still in in a big struggle so green party is not influential at all at the moment but the greens kind of uh, environmental uh, concept environmental list uh, still there but green party not powerful at all to, to, to some point. We expect the two Green Party will gradually become powerful from 2012. They did a good job, a little bit, not past the 5% threshold to get the seat in the legislature yet. But 2016, they also increased a little bit the party vote, 2% something is quite low. But 2020, they just work merged with another party. They lose their anything. They don't have their self identity right now. I see. Thank you. I mean, it's. I think it's going to be interesting to see how they're going to fare in the next election, maybe. Yeah, 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 yeah. Green Party mm -hmm. should be a kind of word alliance, but I don't know what internal. In, I just know, green inside of the uh, Green Party, a lot of a struggle problem. Yeah. For sure, uh, we have no more questions from the audience. Uh, yeah. I would like to give you the opportunity to say uh, a few last words if you would like to to add anything to your presentation or anything that struck you during the Q&A. So uh, this is your chance. Okay. Uh, I I don't know how much you fully follow what I said here, but I 
I like to uh, see from more theoretical perspective, see the Taiwan political phenomena. I'm talking about the two party or the kind of party politics in Taiwan over the 70 years, actually, from 1950 to uh, 2020, 2021, actually, right now. But uh, I think political phenomena also always kind of uh, temporal. We will see something about more theoretical, more other things, more human things beyond this. So even though I like to criticize the current authoritarian tendency existing in current Taiwan uh, ruling party, but we need to see the more wider uh, phenomenon worldwide. We should concern about why we got such a problem worldwide authoritarianism. That's why I conclude by a book I present to you called uh, "Can It Be Here." I will share this kind of a uh, kind of a uh, 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 cautious to all of you. Can it be here? Authoritarianism is not really a kind of a dichotomy between this is democracy, this is authoritarianism. It's a not clear cut between the two categories. It exists in everywhere. It's not only in certain political systems. It's not democracy can totally avoid that. Maybe this kind of a thief already embedded in so called democratic. Please pay attention to that. That's my last word. Okay, thank you very, very much for this very insightful presentation and uh, to the audience for their very uh, great questions. And I hope that we're going to have a lot more of this in the future. So, uh, all of you have a good day or a good afternoon if you're in Taiwan. Yeah, so, we are uh, in the afternoon. Yeah. Thank you very much. And uh, we you. hope to see all of you soon. Thank you Bye. for your questions. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. Yeah. Bye bye. Bye. Right.